I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2021. When it comes to protecting the environment, indigenous communities have been taking matters into their own hands for centuries. And given the EPA's recent findings that U.S. indigenous, black, and Latinx communities are bearing the brunt of the negative environmental impact associated with rising temperatures, their sense of urgency is not only unsurprising, but well warranted. Native communities aren't waiting around for nations to sign accords, attend summits, or for another Greta Thunberg critique of world leaders to go viral. They're taking action. When we talk about climate change and climate science, our people, our communities have been dealing with the impact since, you know, for years, for generations. For our communities, it's something that we have been addressing, you know, for years now. If you're an indigenous person, if you're an outspoken indigenous person advocating for the protection of our planet Earth, our mother Earth, you are going to be a target. Environmentalists in the U.S. have long been branded as naturalists from Denver named Tyler, donning dreads and advising his cohorts on where to get the best ganja, man. But while the shoeless Tylers of the world haven't gone anywhere, environmental groups seem to be evolving when it comes to how we frame these issues and whose voices get centered. Whenever I talk about Standing Rock, it's very important that first I acknowledge the young people who really ignited that movement, who made the call to action for people to come to Standing Rock and join them in fighting against the Dakota Access Pipeline. We have a relationship to the earth that is so ancient, we cannot deny it. It only makes sense that when you're tending to it, you would ask that person who, deep, who knows that, who has that knowledge, and right now, the caretakers of these lands are saying, the earth is crying for help. You have to know that. Indigenous people, and when I say indigenous people, I do not mean Native American people. I mean indigenous people of the world have been fighting for this planet, for Mother Earth, Unshimaka, for thousands of years. Since our first touch to this earth, that connection was started. Climate change is not just an indigenous issue. We as mankind, we as womankind, we have taken ourselves out of the sacred hoop. We play just as important role as the ants, the deer, the grass, the wind. All of these things in this world play a role and we've seen what happens when you take one link of that chain out. People have to understand that this isn't climate activism. This is a way of life. Indigenous communities have long acknowledged that our actions today have a lasting impact on future generations and that we have a responsibility to be accountable for that impact. Climate change is impacting Indigenous communities the most, and I think that that's in relation to the fact that despite, you know, making a small percentage of the world's population, we're stewarding and protecting 80% of the world's biodiversity. And I think it's important to also mention that 50% of that biodiversity is located in Latin America. Remember back when the Trump administration appointed a climate change skeptic to lead the EPA, or when it straight up censored scientific climate change information from its website? I'm also trying to forget. In stark contrast to this not so distant era, the Department of Health and Human Services under the Biden administration recently established the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, the first federal program focused specifically on how greenhouse gas emissions affect human health. And while the U.S. government finally gets its act together, the Karuk tribe native to Northern California doubled down on its sustainability efforts, even developing climate adaptation plans which include cultural burns to fight wildfires. Despite everything a cartoon bear and a forest ranger hat might have told you, most experts today believe prescribed burns are the most effective way to preserve wildlife. And California recently passed two bills that support what the Karuk have been saying all along. Sorry, Smokey. It started about a thousand years ago and around our villages, the women did a lot of the burning and they were burning for a fine grain mosaic for the oak woodlands, the grasslands, the basket material, the edible medicinal plants. That intensive management of the homelands 
provided resource in a quality and quantity that was predictable and dependable. And it also worked as a way to um, help to eliminate the threat of catastrophic fire coming in to the village area. We use everything in the landscape. And so for us, prescribed fire is a renewal. In America, there's too many trees per acre, so the trees aren't developing that well, especially with the drought. You see a lot of dead trees in the forest. Fire opens up the area. We use fire to dictate what grows and what does not grow. We are having these catastrophic fires uh, because there's so much fuel. Indigenous groups such as Kruk, a tribe, we weren't able to get burn bosses, people burn boss qualified. And um, even if we did, that person was held liable. And there was no ceiling to the liability that they could be charged a lot of money in their land, they could lose everything. And then we got the bills passed where um, we can afford to have insurance for our burn bosses. The legislation is going to help us. We are starting to work with other people who have the same vision or who understand um, that things need to change. I'm part of the forest. I'm not a visitor to it. This is my home. I've always lived here. I will always live here. Rising temperatures caused by climate change have also led to heavier rainfall, resulting in massive amounts of flooding. And while most of us are familiar with sea level rise, what about ocean acidification or hypoxia? These climate change related crises are forcing native coastal communities to get strategic to preserve their way of life. And whose practices are they putting to good use? Their ancestors, of course. This entire area was very abundant in clam production, you know, and has been all the way up until just recent years, we've noticed a, a pretty serious decline. The harvest of these shellfish and finfish is sustenance for our cultural and spiritual way of life. So this clam garden and the wall building will in turn create more like a seed garden that will help combat the effects of climate change and uh, sea level rise, including ocean acidification. Basically, it's uh, creating a wall over time, as um, sediment builds up on the inside of that wall, your slope becomes more gradual and that window of area becomes greater where the shellfish um, will be growing. It promotes all, all different kinds of uh, sea life. I think what is very special about what Swinomish is doing here is that we're looking to our ancestors for help and pass on you know, our, our way of life. We're creating something great that's gonna take care of our community for many generations to come. When we talk about protecting the planet, we often focus on individual behaviors, like whether we recycle, use paper straws, or let it mellow when it's yellow, among other things. But the frustrating reality is that the impact of individual choices often pales in comparison to the federal government's contribution to man-made environmental disasters. The first images of the splintered pipeline captured 80 feet underwater reveal the more than foot long gash where oil gushed into the Pacific. Authorities now say they're inspecting the 41 year old pipe, which runs from this oil rig to shore for signs of corrosion and pressure problems. In 2015, a Memorial Day flood racked up almost half a billion dollars in damages. Last year, Houston led the U.S. in flood related deaths. The metro area's development has exploded. The Houston area has added 25% more pavement over 15 years, replacing soil rich wetlands that could absorb water with concrete covered suburbia. Its lack of accountability has resulted in some of the worst contamination and unnecessary loss of human life this country's seen. And almost 76 years after one disaster that many herald as one of the most significant scientific achievements of the 20th century, communities across the state of New Mexico are demanding justice. My mom had cancer, my brother had cancer, my sister had cancer, my other sister that was alive at the time had brain tumors. In Carrizoso in 1945, the air was pristine. There was no environmental air pollution. There was no dirty water. There was no chemical poisoning. Well, we were only 40 miles from Trinity site. Well, I grew up in a small town, 30 
man from Trinity Sight. Paul is referring to the site where the U.S. government detonated the world's first nuclear device as part of a top-secret effort codenamed the Manhattan Project. The area, known as the Ornada del Muerto, or Trail of the Dead, was a remote stretch of desert thought to be uninhabited, but New Mexicans living downwind of the 1945 detonation, known as downwinders, claim that there were ranchers living as close as 12 miles from the site. 1945, of course, we're in the midst of the war with Japan. The test had to occur before July 17, which was the first day of the Potsdam Conference, where Truman was going to go in with Stalin and Churchill to negotiate Europe. Truman wanted to walk into that meeting knowing whether the weapon would work or not. The project was rushed, and given its top secret nature, residents near the Tularosa Basin area weren't warned before or after the detonation. Radioactive fallout from the Trinity test landed in cisterns and holding ponds and was ingested by vegetation and livestock relied on heavily by the community. The chief medical officer for the Manhattan Project would later propose an uninhabited radius of at least 150 miles for future testing in order to ensure public safety. I think about my grandma, my uncles and my aunties, and some of them have died from different types of cancers or different diseases that are listed under the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, or RICA law. The law Leona is referring to, RICA, provides a one-time reparation payment to those who may have developed cancer or other specified diseases after being exposed to radiation from atomic weapons testing or processing of uranium. RICA has awarded over $2.4 billion in benefits to more than 37,000 claimants across multiple downwind counties since 1990. The program limits compensation to individuals who live in parts of Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. And because the current RICA law is due to sunset in July of 2022, the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium are calling for federal accountability. We were American citizens. We served our government and we really thought that bringing attention to it would bring relief. That didn't happen. And then when we found out that there had been a fund set up that was compensating other people, paying restitution, et cetera, we couldn't believe it because we were the first people ever exposed to radiation any place, and we had been conveniently left out. Communities like New Mexico, where the Trinity test site was, that community was left out of downwind protections. How could that be? Senators Ben Ray Lujan and Mike Crapo have put forth a bipartisan bill calling for an extension of the existing law, as well as an amendment to include compensation for New Mexico's downwinders. And on the lower house, a companion bill was introduced by another New Mexico native. I've seen firsthand the impact on the families who were either miners of uranium or potentially exposed through the uh, explosion of the first atomic bomb here. And it's heartbreaking and you can't but help be moved to do something. But not everyone is on board. The science does not support the assertion that atomic weapons testing caused widespread instances of cancer. Representative Tom McClintock from California, for example, opposed the RICA amendment on the House floor earlier this year and credited the testing with preventing a military invasion. We reached out, but his office declined to comment. In contrast to Representative McClintock, New Mexico legislators argue that an apology from the federal government is long overdue. And for them, the battle is personal. I had lost my father to esophageal cancer, my mother to lung cancer non-smoker, my sister to lung cancer non-smoker, my grandmother to leukemia. It was only after I began working on these that I realized that they were exposed, um, my grandparents and my parents, to the explosion because of where they lived. My dad was a state representative and a speaker of the house in New Mexico as well. He passed about a decade ago with a bout of stage four lung cancer. My dad was not a smoker. Um, he got sick because of exposure on the job while working uh, as an iron worker at Los Alamos National Laboratory. New Mexico is home to multiple indigenous communities like the Mescalero Apache in the Tularosa Basin and the Navajo or Diné Nation in the north, many of whom have been impacted heavily by both uranium mining and radiation. Rica is a Band-Aid. The actual thing that needs to happen is 
cleanup of all the abandoned uranium mines across the country. Stop doing nuclear testing. Stop developing and creating new nuclear wastes that we don't even know how to handle. And yes, we need RECA. We need, we need that law to continue in perpetuity because radiation continues in perpetuity. I think it's very clear that New Mexico hasn't been treated fairly. We haven't been provided the data yet concerning their radiation exposure. The fact that our government did nothing to collect data, did nothing to assure safety, actually put secrecy over safety and put human beings at risk during the testing. Because of all of those things, they, there should be no one excluded because they can't prove or disprove who was affected and who was not. This bill will mean the difference between life and death for some people. Throughout Latin America, some governments are doling out sacred lands to the highest bidder and deforestation and oil drilling continue to displace native people. And while it's still considered the most dangerous place for environmental activists, these individuals offer some hope as they continue to risk everything. Three out of four assassinations of environmental activists occur in Latin America. Indigenous peoples are disproportionately targeted in these attacks despite being only 5% of the world's population. No queremos llegar ahora a enfrentar con el gobierno con lanza a matar, a amenazar. Simplemente nosotros venimos con mucho respeto, decir que respete a nuestros derechos. In the Amazon, governments and corporations threaten indigenous people's way of life. Y él precisa diminuir a terra allá no mar, que a terra no mar é grande y poco indio. Él quiere explorar. Nosotros dependemos de la selva, de territorio, del río. Si Petrolera entra en esta comunidad guaraní de Pastaza, nos va a afectar a nosotros, a todos los comunidades guaraní que vivimos como 22 comunidades más, comunidades ampliadas. In Mexico and Central America, similar forces are causing indigenous peoples to leave their lands and migrate to the U.S. En nuestros territorios tendríamos mejores condiciones de vida. Mi hijo no tendría una necesidad de migrar o no tendría necesidad de ser jornalero si tuviera las condiciones para poder trabajar la apicultura, para poder sembrar la milpa. Desgraciadamente, usted sabe toda la necesidad y el, el problema que existe en nuestro país. Todos están emigrando, pues. For indigenous peoples, the key to fighting climate change lies in protecting their right to stay on their territories. They occupy less than a quarter of the world's surface area, but their lands are home to 80% of the world's biodiversity. A pesar de no ser los mayores um, devastadores de la biodiversidad, somos los que mayormente vivimos las afectaciones en la pérdida de los ríos, de los lagos, e incluso de la alimentación. Indigenous peoples are demanding people in power to include them in decisions to curb climate change. Demandamos e instamos a los gobiernos, a las agencias y a las partes interesadas a sumar esfuerzos para proteger la tierra, dar certeza jurídica, garantizar fondos efectivos para desarrollar las capacidades, las nuevas tecnologías en combinación con la consulta libre, previa e informada. Here in the US, waiting on the federal government to act isn't an option, especially when some politicians believe no land should be off limits. Our creation story tells us that there was a time we were able to communicate with the caribou and we made a vow to each other to always take care of each other. So over 40,000 years, we migrated alongside the porcupine caribou herd due to climate change and, uh, you know, a pipeline being put in the middle of uh, Alaska. Many of our communities no longer get the caribou. In the beginning of 2017, um, you know, when Trump opened our sacred lands to oil and gas development, they done it in a very disrespectful way. So when the new administration came in, the Biden administration, who made many promises to save, you know, the Arctic refuge, we got right on it and we lead the fight in protecting the, the Calvin grounds. We call it Ejikwetsan, Bondai Kotlit, the sacred place where life begins. So we are going to continue to pressure um, the House and Senate to restore protection in the Arctic Refuge. This area is very sensitive. Birds from all, from seven different continents 
migrate up there. The whales, even that's their birthing area, our identity as Wichita people is interconnected to the caribou, to the land, water, and to the animals. That's at risk. Our culture, our way of life, it's who we are as a people. And uh, our identity is not up for negotiation. Indigenous communities have long prioritized the well-being of future generations when confronting rising temperatures or utilizing natural resources. It's like a college fund for humanity's future. We sacrifice a little bit now so that little Jimmy doesn't have to study computer science in an apocalyptic wasteland. According to the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, while Native communities are disproportionately impacted by climate change, they're also the least funded. Paying these communities directly for environmental services, as opposed to funding governments vulnerable to corruption, has actually reduced deforestation in Ecuador, Mexico, and Peru. Probably 60% of Peru is, a, is an Amazonian forest. In this forest, there are people living, uh, and many of them are indigenous uh, uh, populations. Among them, also, there is a group of people who are uh, what is called the uh, isolated indigenous peoples. Yabarita Piche is one of those areas. There are several populations living in this area, which is about 2.7 million acres. The uh, initiative is run uh, by the uh, Peruvian government organization that is in charge of this, which is part of the Ministry of Culture. But they cannot do it without the help of all the different organizations of um, indigenous peoples that are in Peru. Our support is mainly financial to provide resources for a number of processes that are necessary to create this area. We need to we needed to make sure that there are indigenous peoples living in the area. And there have been a number of studies supported by us to corroborate, number one, where they are and also in what state of danger they are. Working with indigenous communities and giving them a seat at a sustainably sourced upcycle table could offer some much needed assistance in our pursuit of a healthier, more sustainable environment and populace for years to come. I'm Gabriela Fresquez for Radar 2021. Thanks for watching Radar 2021. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, there are a lot of issues to choose from. <laughs> so, so many.